Hey, thanks for checking this out. Uh, just a quick note before I actually show the presentation. So you'll see me actually wearing uh, a microphone on my collar throughout the presentation, but unfortunately, I never actually captured any audio from that. It just, it was going, but for some reason, uh, none of it stayed. So unfortunately, I had to work with the phone audio from uh, from the room. Now what that means is you're gonna be hearing a lot of squeaking, you're gonna be hearing like people moving around, people hitting stuff, doors opening uh, far more than uh, I would personally find comfortable, but um, it was a technical error that I only learned about after the presentation. But uh, with that said, I hope you enjoy it and hopefully you find some value. <coughs> So today my presentation is called Anti-EU, uh, Institutional Legitimacy, Symbiotics of Action, and the Vulgar Discourse. Overall goals of this presentation is to define what I'm calling an institutional and a philosophic act. To define the vulgar discourse and then examine those through recent examples in education. And overall, to see if these can be good tools for determining how to fix the credibility crisis overall within institutions. Um, now, one thing, these are lyrics from a song called Anti You. If anybody follows through any of the presentations I do, most of what I, most of my academic work is just trying to insert and persuade people to check out music I like. <laughs> it's mostly coming up with everything to fulfill that goal. Um, so for some background on what, it turns out I added, um, some background on what I'm calling institutional and philosophic acts, uh, I'm basing this more off of uh, Habermas's idea of the theory of communicative action. Now, in that, it's a very dense text, but we're just extracting a few points. There's instrumental action. Now, instrumental action is just sort of regular things you do lift off of the open doors, it's how you interact with the world around you, and those actions tell you what you understand to be the reality around you. Now, Habermas was more interested in the societal impact of this, how people interact with one another, and for that he defined strategic action and communicative action. Strategic action is essentially treating other people as if they're tools. So, interacting with a door, you're not thinking of the door as a person. If you do that to a person, that's strategic action. Say somebody has a lot of money, you don't care what their wants are, what their needs are, you just use them to get your goal. Uh, Habermas saw that this was more prevalent than it should be, so he wanted to move towards communicative action in which people would understand each other's goals and try to figure out how to get those goals aligned and so that they could fulfill to the best of their ability everyone's collected goals. Uh, so there's far more on that. Habermas goes into public sphere, private sphere, government, economy. <laughs> it's, it's more than we're trying to hit. So uh, first, the institutional act. First off, it can be strategic or communicative. You can essentially do an institutional act where you treat other people as instruments, or you can do it as communicative uh, form. That's not the important part. The important part is a primary effect of an institutional act is the ability to shift the legitimacy and influence of an institution. So this can be either positive or negative in that you can give an institution legitimacy or remove legitimacy from it. So for some, uh, for some examples, education, accreditation is probably the foundational institutional act of most universities. You get accredited that uh, communicates to people that this is a place you can go get education that is uh, justified among several layers. Another one is exposing corruption, which again, that's a could be positive, could be negative, but the general idea is that you are at the base, there is an effect of effect, uh, not affecting, changing the legitimacy of how people view that institution. <laughs> now, a philosophic act is similar in that it can be strategic or communicative, but a primary effect is the transmission of belief. So it's doing an action in such a way that people understand more of your worldview. And that can be ontological, phenomenological, moral, it's across multiple layers. So for some examples, the refusal of vaccines or certain medical procedures would be a way for somebody to communicate what they believe about medical science, institutions of medical science, whatnot. Uh, or a fun one, uh, choosing Linux over Windows, which you should all do, which I do on a regular basis. <laughs> 
<laughs> so with that, uh, we can understand the vulgar discourse a little bit better. Now the big problem with the vulgar discourse, and I'm using vulgar here in kind of multi-layered way. Vulgar as sort of a nod to people outside of institutions tend to speak more crass. Uh, but it's also that it's the aggregate of discourse outside of institutions. It's an old Roman term to denote those who were in the government, in the state, and those who were not. <coughs> now, the problem there is it's not a formalized, structured discourse. When it comes to the uh, vulgar discourse, it's this amalgamation of everything that happens outside of institutions. And because of that, there's no formalized, combined goal or message. We have no way of finding a journal of vulgar discourse. But you can find, say, for instance, the Harvard Law Review. You can get a general view of what Harvard's legal position is, but you can't get that for everything outside of Harvard. So it's impossible to understand as a whole, generally has to be segmented. Now, some common ways we use to actually understand the vulgar discourse is, well, most common surveys. We go out and we ask people what they view about their subjects, what they do in their lives, try to figure out patterns there. Uh, other ways we tend to do it is that we extract the, uh, repeated phrases or actions. So, for example, if we have a very large Facebook group and we see that they continually bring up the Jewish question or Pizzagate, we usually use that to extract some information about what that group believes and what it's focused on. We also <coughs> tend to analyze social overlaps. So, for example, if you have uh, a certain group of people that <coughs> hold a particular belief and you find that they're following certain news organizations, people tend to create ideas of that. Now, <coughs> the institutional and philosophic acts of vulgar discourse are what I propose to be a useful way of extracting information about the vulgar discourse and specifically how it's impacting the institutions today. So by focusing on the interactions between the institutions and the vulgar discourse, we're finding that middle point where this sort of nebulous, difficult to understand thing is interacting with something that we know very well and we actually have uh, vested interest in knowing well. Um, with that, we can extract and understand the regular occurrences. So not just one-off events, but what seems to happen time and time again. And because of that, we pull out uh, consistent patterns and we'll be able to get a better, broader view of uh, what people are focusing on. Not just complaining in, say, a Facebook group, but what they're actually going for, what they're doing with institutions. So I've got some recent examples from education, and I'll go through those pretty quickly. Um, but generally, rise in homeschooling, an uptick in book removals, and DEI legislation recently. So rise in homeschooling, this was over the last five years, we've gone from about 1.2 million to roughly 2.7 million homeschooled students in the United States, and that's on the secondary school level. <coughs> now, it tells us a couple things. It tells us that parents are believing they should remove their kids from, uh, from these schools. The schools are trying to brainwash them, all these sorts of things. But generally, from the action itself, we can tell that the efficacy of educational institutions, according, uh, according to the people who are doing this, is waning. Uh, it could be uh, for all sorts of different reasons, the type of homeschooling they go to, if it's structured, unstructured, or if it's unschooling, or some other radical thing, that would be able to tell us more, but it's specifically the move towards homeschooling. And I call that a soft undermining of legitimacy, because what it's doing is they're removing people from the institution, but they're not changing anything within the institution itself. So you can move up in sort of severity for this, with the uptick of book removals, in which, uh, generally, these are people who are now saying that what is available to students is actively harmful. They believe they need to change it. And for that, I said it's kind of a soft, firm undermining of legitimacy because it is them reaching in and trying to change something available to students. <coughs> now, in Utah, I said it was a hard one because that is elevated to, uh, there's actually the Sensitive Materials Bill. This is now an institution interacting with another institution, and specifically people using the institutions to try to affect the legitimacy of the education uh, of education within Utah. Uh, and then finally, DEI legislation, probably the uh, biggest one that's happening right now. I believe it's now 11 states that have passed this sort of legislation. 
And that's another example of hard undermining of legitimacy in that people are believing that in, uh, educational institutions are implementing divisive practices that are doing it for cultural or ethnic reasons, and that they believe it's so severe, they have to get the government involved and legislate into law ways to prevent this. And how they're doing it is the methodology of what they're approaching that tells us a lot about how, uh, not hard, hard is the wrong word, but how strongly they believe um, that this is harmful. Now, that's that's everything I gotta present. I'm more of a go with the flow guy. Uh, if any of you got questions, I'll take those now. Uh, Habermas's uh, text that you use, when did he write that? Uh, the theory of communicative action, if I remember correctly, was 1972. It was, it was the early 70s, if I remember correctly. I actually got it. Here. Yeah, it doesn't tell me the date. Um, but any other questions while I'm looking this up? <laughs> Wondering about the, the analysis of, of the three examples and, and whether only the first action conforms to the vulgar discourse impacting with an institution, whereas the last step we see is like two institutions impacting. Yeah. Uh, and, and similarly, the second one also, it does seem as though once things are getting removed, it is at the institutional level. Yeah. Yeah. So would it just be the first one that is looking at vulgar discourse? No, it's all of them are different severities of the vulgar discourse, sort of reaching into an institution to affect uh, legitimacy on some level. Okay. So when it comes to homeschooling, I call it a soft one. Because again, they're not specifically changing anything about the institution, but they are removing people from it. They're trying to say, we don't want our children to be involved in this institution. Usually, uh, most of them are middle schoolers, if I remember correctly. So it's usually at the middle school level, they go, I don't want my kids in that institution. Any other questions? What got you initially interested in researching this? Um, mostly because... Oh, whoa. So, this... The fun thing that I love is that I'm noticing the shift in academia in that it's no longer sort of the premier place that people tend to have conversations. The first presentation I ever did was about how Nietzsche, as a thinker, is more prevalent outside of academia than he uh, has been within academia. So you have classes about Nietzsche, you have professors that talk about Nietzsche, but the actual ideas that Nietzsche talks about, you'll find in metal music, you'll find in movies, you'll find in actually in hip hop, I found quite a few examples. It's the, the actual ideas that most people are focusing on tend to be outside of institutions. But we're now at a point where with uh, social media, with the internet, people are going there. They're avoiding institutions, they're moving away from it, but they're also coming back and hitting institutions. And this is leading to what uh, a lot of people are calling the credibility crisis. People aren't trusting the World Health Organization because they can go up to a Facebook group that tells them all they need to know about the, their uh, medical truth and whatnot. And because we're, we're seeing this shift, especially in the last five years or so, uh, trying to get an, an idea of how to understand that, how uh, sort of the discourse, uh, which when Foucault came up with his uh, discourse analysis, he was very much focusing on uh, government, states, education, and how that affected the discourse. I'm finding that it's kind of now going the other way. Many institutions are having to feel like they're having to catch up to what's going on on Twitter or Facebook or TikTok. We're shifting, and we, nobody knows how to deal with that. And so I find that to be a very interesting problem. So with the severity going up after the effect of the DEI legislation, what do you think is next? Like after that, is it going to be the complete removal of the system? So, yeah, that, there is an interesting part in what Habermas talked about in that um, action as a way of communicating ideas is interesting in that if somebody is successful in their action, they, what that tells them is they're correct about the world. So the rise of DEI legislation is particularly interesting because when it successfully passes, that tells the people who support it, actually, we're on to something. 
these education educational institutions are absolutely trying to undermine our like non-racist society. They're trying to divide us racially by introducing diversity, and it, like it's telling them they're onto something. And the more successful they get, the more confident people will be that they, yeah, we absolutely need to remove books from libraries. We need to change uh, diversity and equity in education. So unfortunately, because it's been so successful even in certain portions of the country, including Utah, where I'm from, um, I don't see that. I don't see them slowing down. It's more a question of, well, they got that yeah. one. What are they going to do next? Yeah. Any others? What do you think is the most interesting or absurd example of the Mulberry Discourse? I'll go with interesting because the, the most interesting to me is um, generally music. Because I just love music, but uh, like I said, half of what I do in academia is to find the music I like and figure out how to make that sound like it's, like it's smarter than it actually is instead of just me being in my room like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> but I, I do find that there's sort of a, a discourse within music. I, you could certainly tell it in style and such, but uh, lyrics, themes, they evolve over time. And if you follow the history of, say, just one genre, that that is a fascinating discourse to look in within the... That's a sub-discourse within the older discourse. Hell, do I cough a lot? <laughs> but besides the point, um, just a few uh, post notes now that I've gone through the conference and really had some more time to uh, reflect. For one, I just, there, that was not enough time. For the idea that I was really trying to hit there, I realized, like, man, this is not one that I can really do in a 10 minute session, which. Uh, they give you 10 minutes for your presentation and 5 minutes for questions. D given the fact that the the moderator had to continually say, like, hey. <laughs> um, certainly, there there is a lot more about this that I need to expand upon. But uh, for me, that's actually a good sign. Because for me, this means this is a, a uh, research project that I can really push. I can take further. I can try and see if... Uh, I find new avenues of really explaining the idea, but also finding new examples of what I'm actually trying to get at. Because I think I've, I've sort of gotten to a core of many, actually many of the presentations I've done in the past, uh, including the very first presentation I did, which um, I did mention it in this one, but the uh, sort of the the evolution of Nietzschean ideas through metal, um, which I'll actually link that in the description because that's not on my channel. That's that's on some other channel. But um, that one that one was pretty much the start where uh, I had this idea and I'm like I'm trying to explain this central core idea of there seems to be this shift, this change, in that academia is no longer where most people get their ideas. Most people get their ideas outside of academia. And for me, and I do want to make this clear, that's not a bad thing. I brought up a, a few examples here in this, uh, in this presentation, and I also brought it up in several other presentations where this might actually lead to some problems. But at the same time, I think there is somewhat this evolution of how we communicate ideas broadly that could, could, and that is a very, very operative word here, could be beneficial. Uh, where we're where we're at right now is it seems to be, um, and this was a discussion I was having earlier of. Uh, subcultures, subcultures and fragmentation that are happening within a wide, wide variety of groups uh, seems to be at a very, very negative point right now in that um, they're really, for me, for me, this, the, apparently this is a controversial position, but for me, there really is no mainstream 
Um, a lot of people tend to refer to the mainstream, but whenever I ask people what the mainstream is, uh, it, there doesn't seem to be like a, a clear cut answer of what mainstream is nowadays. And the fact that even for, for the average person, what is considered to be mainstream is kind of fuzzying around the edge tells me a lot about how we're understanding sort of our epistemic uh, I think I'm using that word correctly, uh, our epistemic limits, our epistemological uh, understanding of the world is coming from a very, very limited place of here are the, like, here are the 15 to 20 people that I talk to on a regular basis, and that's about it. Or it's something even weirder in that some, like somebody is pulling all of the information they have about the world from uh, what is essentially a handful of social media accounts or YouTube channels or Twitch channels or um, even kick channels, TikTok, TikTok accounts. Like, we seem to be in this weird spot where institutions are no longer the predominant, uh, the, pre the predominant, what is the word? Uh, the predominant chapels? Chapels is not the right, the predominant uh, hierarchy of understanding where educate not education but where information yeah it comes from nobody it, like half the nation doesn't even trust uh, news media at this point and f actually for good reason but also kind of this brings up new questions of like well if we can't trust a mainstream who do we trust and what people are turning to is it's becoming this fractured weird hole which to me is kind of an interesting question and sort of the, the main reason why I think I'm I'm pushing into something here that might actually prove useful um, for not only myself but for other people this idea that um, we can kind of extract the the meeting point between institutions which they're still around they still have plenty of power but that power is waning it is no longer the the dominant uh, the dominant voice within a wider discourse and trying to understand how the the old institutions are interacting with this crazy new freaking world that we got is to me a very very interesting question because i think we're at a fundamental turning point when it comes to um the transmission of ideas the transmission of communicating ideas, the transmission overall of knowledge and information, and being able to extract how that information is warping in a way that I don't I don't think humans were ever really prepared for. When you're talking about the the internet, I don't think humans overall were prepared for this mass uh, mass communication network. Um, no, they they certainly could. I I am. 100% open to the idea that um, we actually will adapt very, very well. And there's actually some pretty interesting evidence that um, that we actually have adapted too well <laughs> in, in a certain way, but I, I don't want to get into that here. But the overall point, and I wish I had more time to expand on this, is that where we're at in understanding who who determines credibility is kind of a weird point in that we still we're still in this interesting spot of it's typical to point towards somebody like um, the United Nations for uh, talking about it's sort of the legal standard for multiple nations but then you'll just spiral off into some Facebook group or Discord server where people are bringing up all sorts of things that just do not mesh with that. And then you find that it's more prevalent in very, very weird corners of just kind of disparate, disparate, disconnected uh, chat rooms that essentially have no power. They don't sway anything, but the ideas seem to transmit through multiple groups and trying to understand that and trying to understand the evolution of ideas in, in sort of this new methodology of, of disconnected, disjointed communication is 
probably to me a, a very interesting project that I'm going to be pursuing for a, probably several years at this point. This this the more I try to communicate this idea with other people, the more I realize that there is just not there's just not a lot of information about how this operates. I know a lot of people have opinions on how it should operate and whether or not how it's operating right now is good or bad. But for me, that's not really the question. For me, the question is, well, how do we know this is working? What What is, what is happening? And how do we know it's happening in the way that we understand it to be? And that's, we just don't know. Nobody knows. Unfortunately, we have good ideas, uh, but often many of those good ideas kind of come across barriers. But um, I suppose I've added a little too much to this post note. The overall, the overall message is that we're in a weird spot when it comes to communication, and I'm hoping that what I've presented here is at least the start. It's at least the start of a more interesting idea of how to kind of extract the oddity into something more understandable and definable in that we can use it to understand how conversations are shifting, how our, our communications along philosophic lines of uh, worldviews, ep epistemology and ontology, like how we can better extract this information and thus maybe, maybe, the, the ideal hope is that this helps somebody uh, really put together a better idea of how to bridge the communication together. Because I am with Habermas on this one. We should, the growth of strategic action is a terrifying prospect. So we must foster more communicative action. We need to try and get people to better understand each other as operating individuals and try to get the wider conversation to be more amicable not agreeable nobody has to uh, agree but we have we have to at least get to a point where <laughs> we're we're not legitimately like storming the fucking capital or burning down courthouses we we we're in a rough spot with that and i'm hoping that this these definitions that I've provided here, the Institutional Act and the Philosophic Act, can help people try to bring together an understanding, or at least a way to better understand what maybe the opposite side is saying. That's the overall hope. And if it works for even one person, I, you know what, I've done my job. <laughs> I'm just some schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you, um, and I hope you have a good day.